If you're like me, you spend lots of time pouring over maps, looking at weather data, all in an effort to help predict when and where my best times to hunt will be. It'd be nice if there was a reliable source with all this information in one place. Enter the Spartan Forge app. Unlike some other predictive apps on the market, Spartan Forge was created from military combat intelligence experience tailored for hunters and stands at the nexus of machine learning and white-tailed deer hunting. No more man-made algorithms. This is a predictive model based on real GPS collared deer data, historical and predictive weather, and the next level of mapping imagery, all at my fingertips. I've been using the iOS app this season, and it has replaced all my other mapping tools. Visit SpartanForge.ai and sign up today, or head to your iOS or Android app store. Use the promo code TRUTH to save some money and download it today. Mobile hunters, if you're interested in upping your mobile game, then head to tetherednation.com and check out their saddle gear. There are a few things you can actually buy that will help you become a better deer hunter or give you the freedom to hunt any tree or any situation. This is the reason why I started saddle hunting in the first place and why I use Tethered's gear. I can honestly say that Tethered's saddle gear has changed how I hunt for the better. Big tree, little tree, from the ground, it doesn't matter. I'm untethered by my gear to hunt the best setup for the situation, instead of hunting for a tree that my gear can use. My current core setup consists of the Phantom Saddle, Tethered One Sticks, and the Predator Platform, along with an assortment of their accessories. So if you want to up your mobile game, head over to tetherednation.com. Welcome to the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast brought to you by Spartan Forge. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 330. Today, I'm joined by my buddy, Tony Peterson, and we're talking about becoming a better person to be a better hunter. So stay tuned. What is up, everyone? Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you are doing well. Hope you are feeling fine. The uh, I got to tell you, man, getting a little getting a little angry with this uh, weather, man. Um, it's supposed to be rainy all day Saturday this past weekend, so I made plans to do things around the house because um, it looked like it was going to be a soaker, and so I, <clears throat> I did not make any plans to do any scouting. Did not make any plans to go to the North Piece, and uh, yeah, so it rained. A very light, sporadic rain until probably like 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Nothing that would keep you out. Well, there was like a, da- there was a soaker in the morning, probably like around 9, 9, 30. And then after that, it was just like, like spitting rain here and there for like two hours, which didn't amount to anything. And then the sun came out. It was like almost 70 degrees. It would have been a great day to get some scouting done, but I had already kind of committed myself to some other um, to, to some other duties during the course of the day. And so next weekend, come hell or high water, I will be scouting in the North piece. I don't care how much it rains. Cause I am, I'm tired of being bamboozled by the, uh, by the weatherman. It's like the only job that you can be almost a hundred percent wrong a hundred percent of the time. And you're still doing an okay job. But anyway, with that, we're going to go ahead and just kind of get cranking today. Uh, before we do that, one quick piece of housekeeping, our buddies over at, uh, over at Exodus got some cool stuff going on. So, you know, you guys know as well as I do, if you've run trail cameras over the course of time, especially kind of some cheap, you know, crappy cameras, you have some old ones that are just kind of laying around that are either broken or completely worthless or whatever the case is. Thankfully, right now, after a ton of great feedback from last year during this program, Exodus is opening up a, an upgrade program. So how does, how does this work is probably what you're asking. So in short, order any camera on ExodusOutdoorGear.com out, uh, and use the code UPGRADE, U-P-G-R-A-D-E, and uh, you will save 25% on any Exodus render, render bundle, rival, or rival bunder. After placing your order, the Exodus team, they'll send you a return label for your trading camera. After receiving the camera, they'll ship you your full order. Uh, If you're new to Exodus, I'll just say this. They have five-year warranty, five-year theft and damage coverage, and they have best-in-class customer service. I've been using Exodus for seven years, um, and it's proven to be the most reliable trail cameras that I've ever personally used. In fact, I still have some from the first batch of trail cameras that I bought from them that are still in the woods today. Be sure to take advantage of this unique savings opportunity. Replace old junky cameras with the bulletproof and dependable Exodus camera. This upgrade, upgrade program is only good for the remainder of April or while supplies last, so hop on it. All uh, As always, 
Be sure to head over to their website and sign up for their email newsletter to stay up to date with all their announcements. This is where you're going to get all the latest and greatest from those guys when they have sales and just new products coming out and and interesting stuff they have going on. I've caught wind also that they have some really uh, cool announcements and things that are coming down the pipeline. So sign up for uh, the mailing list to make sure you don't miss out. For all the details on this campaign, head to exodusoutdoorgear.com backslash pages backslash exodus upgrade program. I'll also put a link uh, uh, to this uh to this campaign in the uh, show notes of this podcast episode. So with that, we're going to go ahead and jump into today's show. I got my good buddy, Tony Peterson on. You guys know him. You love him. Uh, he's been, you know, working with meat eater for quite a while now. He, he hosts some of the wired to hunt, uh, podcasts when, when, when Mark is off, um, doing whatever else he is doing, uh, aside from the, uh, aside from the podcast, Tony's one of my favorite people to talk to about hunting or about anything in general. Um, we're very much birds of a feather to where we um, enjoy um, challenging things outside of hunting. And uh, it, we enjoy challenging ourselves and trying to be better, not just at hunting, but the things in our life and that we always seem to find a way that uh, to kind of connect those things back to hunting. And when we get better in one area, there's this weird kind of corollary effect that happens that we ultimately start to get better at hunting. And so we talk a lot about that during, uh, during the course of this episode, as always great conversation with Tony. Hope you guys dig it as much as I did. And as always, thank you all for listening. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the truth from the stand deer hunting podcast. And today I've got all my buddy, you know, him, you love him. He hails from the Midwest, Mr. Tony by God, Peterson. What's going on, man? Dude, that's the best introduction I've ever gotten. Yeah, nice, nice. Yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to work on that. I usually try to throw something in there that's slightly like degrading, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm I might be a little bit like over complimentary of that because I've I'm actually old enough where I used to do like a lot of deer classics and stuff, and then you would do like radio shows to promote it, and right. you'd get you know like the morning radio show or whatever, and they were like they had no clue who you were, so they would look at your website for like eight seconds beforehand, jot down three notes and they'd be like, Oh, here's Troy Peterson. And he does, you know, like so, that was a wonderful introduction there. Nice. Yeah. Here's Troy Peterson. Uh, he likes to hunt, uh, sometimes fish and he's a, and he's a male. Yeah. You, you've been to Africa. Like they're like just barely cliff notes. Yeah. 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 That's, That's awesome. Man. All right, good man. I'm glad. I'm glad I could do you uh, do you justice on that intro. It's a, so the one that I always do um, is uh, I don't know if you know John Johnny Utah. Uh, he used to be on the show with me like quite a bit back in the day, but every time I would have him on, it became like this running thing where I would try to have a new nickname for him every time he would come on. So, you know, it's been like Johnny, by God, you know, the Rattler Utah, you know, <laughs> like just like whatever I could kind of come up with. And so it became like this running thing where it's like five minutes before we like jump on, I'd be like sitting down, like with a piece of paper, like writing down like different nicknames, like to see if I could come up with something. But uh, that was kind of our, our running joke. But man, how you been, dude? It's been a little while since we, uh, since we got the chat. Man, I am, I am at the place where when you live in Minnesota and you had snow in November and you still have snow into April, you're like, uh, get me out of this shit a little bit, but otherwise... <laughs> I got a whole bunch of turkey tags lined up and I'm getting ready to go do some serious winter scouting. And I don't know, man, I've been working out a lot, fishing down in Florida a few times and just trying to maintain my sanity, you know? Nice. Yeah. The, uh, it's, you've been getting all the snow and the North piece. I have yet to get up there to scout because every time I try to go, it's like, they'll get like five inches of snow. It's not the five inches of snow. It's what had previously melted and then created a three inch layer of ice underneath of it which just makes it, you know, pointless to go traipse around and partially some of the areas, like even just to drive into like is kind of dicey, you know, with that kind of stuff. Cause those roads aren't maintained at all. So I've yet to get up there. And then beyond that. So now it's finally like all kind of melted off, but now, you know, working stiff, like a lot of people out there listening, it's, uh, it's weekends, right? It's like Saturdays and Sundays. And so it's like, I keep watching the radar and every Saturday since it feels like the middle of January it's rained like every stinking Saturday to where it's like, cause of what I want to do is I want to take off like a Monday, like take a personal day and be able to go up like Saturday, Sunday, Monday and hit like three days of like, because then I'm like, if I can get three days in and I can kind of do the same thing over Turkey season and go get like another three days in and then maybe go get like two more during the summer. Like I'll be pretty good up there. You know what I mean? Like that'll be, I'll be pretty solid. Cause I'm just dialing in some stuff that I've already kind of known. And then 
exploring a few new little areas. But I just can't catch a break with the weather, man. It's just it's killing me. It's driving. Me. I also need it for my sanity. I need a little uh, a little trailer therapy, as I like to call it. Oh, dude, man! I I was talking to my wife about that the other day because we, you know, we haven't really had a shed season yet. We haven't really had a winter scouting season. I mean, you can get out, but it's still. I mean, the the snow on the end of my driveway is still up to like my chest, and I'm just like, Are you serious? Yeah, brutal. And you know. We had kind of like, you know, you're talking about the rain. We've had some rain too. So we get these conditions where it's, we've basically had like post holing kind of snow for five months now. And so I, I took my daughters out one day, probably, I don't know, mid February. They're like, we got to go shed hunting. And I knew it was going to be worthless, but I'm like, let's just go. And, right. you know, we go post hole out there for a quarter of a mile. And they're like, this is stupid. I'm like, there's no deer tracks. They're all gone. And the, the walking is just, even the dogs are like, what? This is, this is stupid. So we're going to have a, you know, we're going to have a real condensed winter scouting situation here, but mm-hmm. you know, we'll have good shed days. Cause once this snow melts, it's going to be really good for a little while. And so I'm kind of, you know, I've been looking at my, my turkey hunting schedule this year. Cause I got a pretty heavy turkey schedule and I'm like, okay, where can I scout? during this hunt and how can I build it into this one? Kind of like you, where it's like, right. you, know, you might only be looking at three, four, five, six days total of scouting, but you know, you can get a lot done if you're pretty efficient and you, you got a little plan going. You know? Yeah. I almost feel like, um, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm getting older. I don't know. I almost feel like when I have less time, I actually, I'm almost better off in a really, in a really weird way. Like I get really kind of focused. Cause like, at least like I've been able to get out and scout a little bit locally. It's still been kind of rainy. So I've not been able to get out as often as I would like, but I've really kind of backburnered the areas that I've hunted previously. Cause I kind of know those areas. I kind of know what to expect in those spots. I know why they're good. Last year I got kicked in the balls because what I realized was that I had no acorns and a lot of those primary scrapes were still being used but like the super high activity was really more related to like that food being so close to that dough bedding. And it wasn't that close this past year. And so that was, that was tough. So it, so it was rough. So I'm kind of like looking in some of those areas, like for additional food, but I know where the food's at in those areas. I just need the food to be there is really, is really all I need. Right. And so now I'm kind of like going, Oh, there's a spot over here, you know, and it's, it might be a small spot and I can go walk it and like, two and a half hours or whatever, you know, not the whole thing, but like the area that I want to focus on and I'll go walk it for two and a half hours and there'll be another one. that's like a mile away and I'll walk that for two and a half hours and me and the pup do like a five hour day, six hour day. And we've covered two chunks that I wanted to kind of like take a look at. And so I feel like I'm still getting the work in. I'm just doing it a lot quicker than I've probably done it in years past. You know, listen, I think there's something to be said about that when you know, when you talk to Andy May and some of these guys, and it, this this same thing hit me when we had our kids, it was like when you went from kind of just being free, and I, you know, I had a lot of time to hunt, and now I got like three or four days. I started to get really good, and I kind of made me realize, you know, if you look at like Iowa's a great example, right? If you go down to Iowa, the bow hunters there, if you draw or if you live there, you have the entire month of November to hunt without a gun season coming in, and so there's literally no pressure in October to go. Like there's really no pressure to get after it too hard. You don't feel that looming sense of the gun season coming. And I think it bites a ton of people in the ass because the, the, the mentality of having so much time to do something is like, it causes you to sort of push it off and not take it too seriously. And then when the time comes where you're like, Oh, it's November 7th, I got to go. Well, you and everybody else, and it rains for three days and all of a sudden your hunting isn't what you thought. And you had all of that wasted time. It's kind of like, you know, people who are like, oh, I, you know, I'm retired. I have all day to work out, but I just can't find the motivation to go to the gym. It's like, well, you just, you got to make yourself go. Like, you you got to make yourself go and you just got to say, this is when I'm going to do it. And it's like that time. It's like that finite, like parameters around it. If I don't hit this window, I missed it. Yep. You know what I mean? Like that's the, and it's interesting you say that because we were talking a little bit about this before we started recording, but uh, like the whole like the whole me jumping into like the jujitsu thing for like, I guess I'm, it'll be like a year in May. I think that I've been doing it. Um, and, uh, and not that I know shit about shit for jujitsu. I mean, a year, a year in jujitsu is like someone who just like, you know, got their first Fisher price bow at five years old, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> that's where I'm at, you know? So let's, uh, I don't want to fool anybody out there. Um, but you know, the, 
what I've started like to learn, you know, or what you, what you learn, like when you're, you know, I'm pretty fortunate. Like the gym that I'm at is, is super cool. There's a lot of, you know, guys that are, that are, that are very skilled that take time to beat me up, but then, then teach me, you know? Um, and the thing you start to pick up from them is just like their, their efficiency and their patience. You know, it's like, I don't know very many guys there that are super skilled, especially our coach. He sometimes looks like he's not doing anything, but he's beating your ass. You know, it's like, and, and so I kind of started thinking about that, you know, as I think about my approach to bow hunting, cause I, I started getting really anxious whenever I couldn't get up to the North piece and I was getting all that rain. I couldn't even get out locally. I was starting to like, that worry was starting to swell up or I was like, man, am I already screwing my season already? And it's March, you know what I mean? I and, you know, and I started sweating it and then I was like, you know what? Like, this is just like, you just have to be efficient. You know, and so you may not have a hundred spots that you feel real good about next year. Like you, you might have, you might have 10 or you might have seven and you just have to be really strategic about how you use them, you know, and you just have to be more efficient with your time scouting. So you need to be dialed. It can't be just traipsing off to go kind of wanderlust on your scouts. Like you got to be focused on what it is you're looking for and what it is that, that tells you to be there or that it's worth even spending more time scouting or not, you know? And so that's really, I think you know, where jujitsu has helped me just in like my mentality of how I kind of frame some of these things. Cause it's no longer like the quality or the quantity of time that I'm spending. It's the quality of time that I'm spending. Cause I see a lot of guys like I logged this many miles, you know, it's like, well, cool. But you know, did you learn anything or are those places any good? You know? Um, and I'm not saying you shouldn't log miles. I think that's important, but I'm just not in a place right now to where I can spend as much time. Yeah. So it has to be good, good time that I spend. Well, and I, I think, you know, when you look at it that way and go, if I get in there for three days and I, you know, even if I find one area a day where I'm like, this is, this has potential at some point, you know, it might be this season, it might be three seasons down the road, but for me, just, just doing that, it gets me to think about it all the time. Like I, mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm like you, like I have spots out there that I found winter scouting five years ago that I still haven't hunted but I think about them all the time and you know, once in a while I go back and revisit them or I look at them and they're just like kind of in the waiting list. And I think the process of thinking about that stuff is like way important. And I, you know, there's, we sell this image of this guerrilla warfare, like go scout and like the guys you're talking about, like, Oh, I walked a thousand miles this year in February and March. And it's like, how much of that are you going to retain? You know, right. like, it, and, and honestly, most people can't do that. It's probably bullshit anyway. They probably didn't do it, but <laughs> they're doing it for the gram. You, you know, I'm, dude, I, I interviewed a guy one time a long time ago and he told me how much, how many miles he puts on scouting. And it was, it was some number like 1500 miles. And I started doing the math cause this was back when I was running, uh, I'm still running a lot, but I was running a lot then. And I was like, man, for me to do a thousand miles in a year of running, like dedicated, it's like every month you're like, holy shit. Like I'm, I'm behind. Like I got to get out there. Like it's a real commitment. And so I'm like. I don't think, I don't think you're stacking all this into a couple months, dude. Like I, I think that was, I think that was a, a high guess, but you know, the reality is like, you just got to get out there and, and get something going, you know, like right. you're, you, people think you're going to go out there and winter scout. You're going to be like, this is the tree. This is the spot. And it might be, but a lot of times you're just like, okay, that, that Oak flat or that Ridge or that crossing or whatever, that was cool. Or that area of the Creek bottom. I really like it. And you circle back, you think about it a lot. You go in there, maybe do an observation sit and you just start to build that stuff up. And I think it's just, I think that's where like a lot of the skill comes from. Right. Or the success anyway. Right. I, I sometimes think too that, and this is just me personally, that if I, so, well, you know, my buddy Greg now, you had, you had Greg on the show. You had Greg on, on the, the wired hunt podcast, you know, love that dude. And he gives me shit all the time because he, he, he'll he tell me, dude, you'll go to w whatever state I'm going to. He's like, and in three days, you will text me, dude, I found a big one. He was like, you know what I mean? He's like, within like a couple of days, he's like, you'll, you'll, have, you'll start to have it figured out. He's like, and you'll have an encounter. He's like, maybe you get an arrow off. He's, you know, the Missouri hunt, you know, I hit one, lost it, whatever the case is. Kansas this year, I had, I think we talked about that a little bit, but I had a, like what you go to Kansas for. Like I had, I saw him twice and. One was just, you know, uh, within bow range on the ground and just could not make it happen. And, uh, and he's like, and you'll go to these places like a no diddly squat 
about where you're going and just show up. He's like, and then you'll be at home. He was like, and you'll be pulling your hair out, trying to figure out where the deer are at. And he's always like, maybe you should just like not do anything and just show up in September and be like, let's do it. You know, it just like, it just kind of, you know, take the same approach you take. And so that's been kind of lingering in the back of my mind. Not that I want to go in completely blind because I do have some areas, you know, around here that I think that I do have some good intel on. But I do think there's a little bit of truth to what he's said to me where I need to maybe have a little bit more than that. And maybe some of this like new time crunch that I'm having is the thing that gets me to kind of do that because I'm always apprehensive to do that during the season. Well, I mean, what you're describing is like crazy common. I mean, I I do the same thing. I, I almost always hunt better on the road. And mm-hmm. I, I think I, I actually just wrote about this. I think part of what happens to us is this thing that we saw or like you see in tournament fishing all the time where if you're if you fish like a little sunday derby everybody's local right like everybody lives within like a half hour but if you fish some bigger level stuff people are coming in from all over even if it's a regional thing you know you might be in illinois and guys are coming in from michigan and wisconsin and wherever you know and you always fear that local knowledge because there's gonna be locals in the tournament but so often they flame out and somebody who lives 500 miles away will dial into something and just crush it. And I always look at that and I go, I think it's because they have too much information if you're local and you think about it and you're like, oh, I've fished the Mississippi River here since I was a little kid. You have so much info. You know, you've caught fish for so long in so many spots and, you know, the water level at this and the water level at that and the weather at this. And it's like that paralysis by analysis thing and you're not in the moment anymore. And I think a lot of people who get good at especially if you're a good public land hunter, you're probably kind of an in the moment, trust your gut type of hunter. And when you have all that information from years and years and years of scouting, it's just like, it's almost over, like information overload. I think, I mean, it, it happens to me a lot, man. Yeah. It's you're hitting a nail on the head, man. Cause like I just had on, I forget, I forget. Oh, is a uh, Travis Keith. I don't know if you know Travis. Do you know Travis? He's a, he's good buddies with Eddie Claypool. That's how I met Travis. It was through Eddie actually. Right. And, uh, and I just had him on, like his episode will come out this week as you and I are recording this. And he is like probably one of the most trust your gut hunters I've ever, I've ever met in my life. And he will trust it to like a T like when, when that he's like, there's usually like a little birdie here and a little birdie here, you know, he's like, and when it tells you to stop, you should stop, you know? And he's like, and every time I've listened, I killed a deer. He's like, every time I've ignored it, something bad's happened. You know what I mean? He's like, so, and it's just, it's crazy. Cause like, you know, I think some people think that you have to be doing this for like 40 years to get that. But like, I feel like, I think you start to have that. I think pretty quickly as a, as a hunter, just spending time and spending time in the woods, but you don't recognize that calling necessarily. Like, that's the part that it takes a little while to kind of like get, it's like, it's there. You're just not paying any, any attention. And then you go to this next level of like, okay, I hear it, but man, I don't trust myself. You know what I mean? And then you go to the next, yeah. Then you go to the next level, which is like, I trust myself today, but not, but I trusted myself yesterday, but not today where it's not consistent. And then you get to like the next level, which I kind of put Travis Keith in that level where it's like, I'm right. So often when I just listen to whenever I get a feeling that there's no use in ignoring it because I'm going to be more wrong by ignoring this gut feeling and having no earthly reason to stop where I'm going to stop other than it feels like I should stop, you know? And that's the part. Those are like the Travis Keiths, the Andy Mays, the Eddie Claypools, right? Where it's just like, they feel it and they're like, yeah, I'm just going to listen to myself. Cause what's the difference? I can either be wrong here or wrong somewhere else, but there's something that's telling me to stay here. Well, I mean, it's partially a confidence thing, you know? I mean, yeah, that's, if people ask me all the time about water because I talk about hunting water all the time or, you know, like staging areas. And it's like, I'm just, there's just places I've, I can find deer easily and they, they transcend public, private, this state, that state. And so it's, it's so much simpler to kind of cut down on that white noise in the background when you're like, the basis for this spot is something I understand really well. And it, mm-hmm. you know, it's like that, maybe that sounds a little bit weird, but like when you're a great example is like, if you're only a whitetail hunter and you go west and you hunt elk for the first time, if you don't hunt with somebody who knows what they're doing, you are probably not going to kill a bull 
just, you're probably just not right. Like you're, you're probably going to flame out and have a rough hunt. But if you go out, like I've, I've got a buddy who lives out in Colorado who I hunt with sometimes and he just knows elk and he'll be like, listen, they're up on the mountain. Those bulls are going to be high. They're going to be orbiting this mountain and they're going to come through here at some point, or they're going to be there at some point, And we're going to just work on that. And for me to, you know, cause I'm usually the guy who says that kind of shit, right? Like I'm usually telling my buddies like, this is how we're going to kill this deer, you know, and sometimes <laughs> it works, sometimes it doesn't. But when you get into that situation where you don't have that confidence and you're used to it, and then somebody else is like, listen, here's how this is going to break down somehow this way it's going to work. It's really nice to see that play out because you go, okay, like this is all of this stuff is pretty similar. You see it in the fishing world. Mm-hmm. You see it. I see it pheasant hunting all the time or working with dogs. Like it's just be there, done that kind of thing and having that confidence and, and just knowing how to filter it through. But even saying that, like, I do the same thing you do where I've got farms I've hunted for like 25 years. And it's like, sometimes I'm like, I don't even know where to start here. I'm like, I could hunt here. I could hunt there. I could go in there. I could go there. I could do this. It's too much. And I'm not thinking like I would be on the road where I don't have 25 years of experience. And I just look at the map and I go, somewhere in here is a buck. I'm just going to go find him. Right. You know? It's yeah. just a different thing. It's hard to learn. Yeah, it, it is. Now, let me ask you this, man. Do you think do you think that, that confidence has to come strictly from deer hunting or hunting in general, the outdoors in general? Or do you think that confidence in general that is able to be harnessed from anywhere? I'm sorry, I'm looking off into space because I'm trying to get my thoughts together. Um, anywhere. Do you think... Yeah. Do you think it can be something that you draw that confidence from anywhere where it's just like, it's just an overall confidence. It doesn't have to be that I'm confident in my, in my scouting ability or my hunting ability. It could be that I'm, I'm just a confident person because, you know, I, I dedicate myself to things. I follow through with things. And when I feel something, I'm just so innately confident that whenever I feel like I'm right, it doesn't matter what it is. I feel like I'm right. Yeah. It's that. I mean, yeah, I think, you know, I think discipline is something that's like, it's just a cornerstone of so much of what we do and so much about what we talk about with hunting and life and just like showing up and just mm-hmm. doing stuff that sucks. And I'm not talking like going to your job, like there's a discipline there, right? Like getting into the cubicle every right. day or whatever you do, yeah. but it's like choosing, you kind of don't have a choice. You kind of got to do that, but like choosing right. to do stuff in your life that's hard is is such a benefit. I mean, I, I, you know, people get kind of sick of you talking about this, but I talk about it a lot. Like when I quit drinking, I started working out. I started killing the shit out of public land bucks. And mm-hmm. it was because I changed my mindset and I changed, like, I suddenly was doing things I thought I could never do. And, you know, like a, a parallel to that is a lot of hunters hit a certain level where they're like, I can kill a year and a half olds. I can kill two and a half. I can have those encounters once in a while with a big one, but I cannot kill them. And they go season to season and it's frustrating. And then all of a sudden a big one walks into 15 yards and they thump it and it runs off and dies. And it's like an entire world opens up to you that you didn't know existed. Now you go, I know I can do this. They're not mythical. Like this can happen. And it just yeah. hadn't before. And once it does, it happens a lot more. And I think, yeah. I think we have the opportunity to open all kinds of doors like that in our life. And we just choose not to. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree with you. The reason I asked that was because, you know, I know, you know, you run a lot, you work out a lot, you know, and I know we've talked about the, you know, the, the, the recreational libation <laughs> kind of piece in the, in, in the past, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, like, I feel like, cause it, it, it comes, I, I agree with you that it comes from almost anywhere in your life that you, that you have discipline and that, and that can be like, you're disciplined about building cars. You know what I mean? Like there's a, a guy I had on and you might know him actually. Um, uh, Jesse Coots I had on He's yeah. from New York public land killer and he's disciplined, but he's also a disciplined like car builder. And like, if you, if anyone's ever seen his hot rods in his cars, like the dude is just like a savage with it. And his life is just like super disciplined. And so it's no surprise that he's really good at killing good deer because whenever he does something, that discipline and that approach just kind of translates. Right. And You know, it's, I think, you know, for me, you know, the jujitsu kind of piece of things has been kind of really important for me as like, I'm almost going to be 45, you know, because I'm a pretty disciplined person and, but my physical discipline had started getting, 
a little bit lax over like the past, probably like two years. Like I wasn't like, I still worked out, but it wasn't quite, quite the same, you know? And there's something happens whenever you go do something hard, whether it's like, you're going to go run, you know, and like, you're going to be committed to running. Like if you don't, if you're not a runner and you just try to go run, run a mile, like that shit will humble you quick. You know what I mean? Where you're like, oh man, I'm not quite as in shape as I used to be. Or that meme that always goes around every hunting season is like, you think you're in shape until you got to drag a dead deer a hundred yards. You know what I mean? It's like it real quick shows you where, where you're at. And so the jujitsu gym was really good for me. And just like, of kind of showing me kind of like where I thought I was or who I thought I was, where I actually was. And then I'm fortunate, like I said before, that I've got some really good guys in the room that I can look to and go like where I want to be. Right. It, the guys that are like, you know, there's a couple, there's a couple guys in there that are, that are a little older, that are more, more advanced than me that were close to the same age. And they're just really, really good. And, you know, and I'll get to roll with them and, and we'll, and we'll train together and stuff like that. And this is kind of getting back to the confidence piece. And, you know, one of them has taken specific amount of time with me to kind of help me out with certain things. And, and, you know, we'll, I'll give him a good tussle once in a while. I mean, he always gets me, you know, he's just, he's been doing it for a while. Um, you know, but he always will tell me like when we get done, like if there's something where I had him in danger, he's like, Hey man, he's like, I was in deep water, like for about 20 seconds, like, you know, where I was like, Oh my God, what did I do? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, and, and I was like, and it, it actually happened, uh, yesterday I hit like this, I was on bottom and I kind of threw him, threw him off me. It, um, you know, I framed him kind of off me and I rolled into like an Ashigrami, which is like a leg position, a leg lock position. And I had a heel hook available, but I didn't go for the heel hook. I actually went to try to roll him through with a toe hold into like a, a knee bar. And the reason I did that was because I'm not confident in my heel hook. Like every time I try to get it, like I don't get it. And so that was where he was like, dude, he's like, there were two moments in that roll. He's like, where you kind of had me in deep water. He was like, there was one he kind of told me about, he was like, it was a minute or, you know, a couple seconds. He's like, it was close, but you know, I had an escape route. He's like, but that Ashi hit or that Ashi roll you did when you rolled into Ashi, he was like, dude, he was like, I was, I was in deep. He was like, like no man's land deep. He's like, you, you had me. And, uh, he's like, why didn't you grab the heel hook? And I was like, cause every time I grab it, I lose it. You know, and he was like, you just need to grab it. He's like, you just need to try it and keep trying it until you, until you eventually get it. He was like, he's like, you just need to get confident when you hit something that you know, you can finish it. He's like, cause you've had a couple of different positions that we've been in where you've actually had a big time advantage. He's like, you just weren't confident to finish it, you know? And so confidence is the killer man in everything, you know what I mean? And if you can gain confidence in one area, it'll translate to another big time, man. And I mean, I think, I think that, you know, when you're, when you talk about that and like not being confident, confident enough to go for that heel hook, you think about in hunting, how often people digest, you know, podcasts and videos and whatever. And it's like, if you're a public land hunter, you got to get your saddle and mobile hunting's all the rage. And these people come into this and sort of think like, you know, I'm going to do what these people I see, you know, like I'm going to do what Andy May or Zach Farrenbaugh or whoever does. And it's like, you're missing all of those little chances to just try for that heel hook and lose it. And what I mean by that is like, when I, you know, when I was growing up, you know, we, we weren't trophy hunters, right? Like it was like, you had a chance to go hunting. You just went hunting. And sometimes you'd save a spot. Cause you're like, sometimes I see bucks in there and I'm not going to go there. So I'm going to go try and build a little ground blind on this, on this, you know, fence line or something. That's like, it doesn't really matter to me. Like, I'm not going to, I know, even when I didn't know shit about deer hunting, I'm like, I'm not going to go in there and see a big buck. Like we never saw big bucks anyway, but you right. go try that stuff. And every once in a while, you know, like you'd kill a doe or you'd have a really cool encounter or something. And you're like, man, it wasn't like, I didn't go for broke here. Like we talk about, and we present this image all the time. Like, a, you know, like being this assassin in the woods, it was kind of like experimenting and just going like, I'm probably going to fail at this, but it's not, it's a lower stakes thing. And I, you know, I grew up doing that all the time. And now, you know, when you trap, like when I travel to hunt, you know, it's not like, even if I draw Iowa, there's times where I'm just like, I'm just going to go sit there just because I think it looks cool. And I think some deer are going to go by, but I have almost no confidence that I'm going to kill a big one here. But you just, sometimes you do that stuff and you're like, okay, well, you're getting better at setups. You're getting better at doing a lot of other things that we don't really talk about, even if it doesn't directly relate to like, here's big buck sign and I'm on it now. And so often when you try that stuff, you're sharpening that blade in ways like you don't think about. And I, I think we kind of missed that message. You know, it's, it's like people are listening to this and they're going, 
you know, getting good at BJJ is not the same thing as getting good at hunting. And we're sitting here going, well, it is mm. <laughs> like it literally, there, it literally no is life where if you get better at it, it's going to make you better. It's just, it's, they're so parallel. It's not even funny. Yeah. I mean, well, you had a quote that I thought was awesome before we even started the podcast and it was, you know, be better to be a better hunter, you know, and that's just in general, man. And like, and as soon as you said that, man, it like, it, it clicked with me because I think I intuitively kind of knew it's like, you know, if you do this, like other quotes been kind of ringing in my head, like the past, you know, however, however long, several weeks, you know, whatever the case is, because there's plenty of days like, so the scouting stuff have been behind it, kind of behind the eight ball, like we talked about. And I kind of had to take a little bit of a different approach this year because I'm just not getting the time in that I, that I typically get in, you know, so I'm having to be more efficient, more specific, more dialed in. And, you know, there's plenty of days at jujitsu where it's like, you know, yesterday was an example. Like I just got my ass kicked yesterday. Like it was one of those days where it's like, you know, in between like rolls, I'm laying on the mat going like, why the hell did I like, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I'm just getting beat over and over again by guys that are better than me. And you wonder if like, if this is worth it, you know what I mean? Like that definitely happens. And I think you go through that with bow hunting too. Like I had a season like that this year. But when I looked back in hindsight, like part of it was, is like, I realized that, you know, when I looked back at my previous hunts, like where I was like really on top of it, you know, previous seasons, I guess I should say, was I was probably in the best mental and physical shape I'd ever been in. And not saying you need to be like uh, Lance Armstrong to kill deer. Cause that's not what, that's not what I'm saying, but like, you got to feel like you're you got to like feel confident in your abilities. And part of that for me is like being like mentally sound, which is also very tied to like my physical capabilities for whatever reason. Right. Like when I feel physically competent, I feel mentally competent and then everything else works, you know? And so when I looked back on that, like I was actually in like the best, like physical and mental shape that I had been in in a long time. And those were the best seasons I had, had ever had. Now you go to this season and now all of a sudden, you know, wasn't in terrible shape by any stretch of the imagination, but just I mentally didn't feel as sharp as I have in the past. I probably physically wasn't as dialed in as I had been in the past. And it showed because the season was a little bit of a struggle, you know? And so the, the what you had mentioned before we jumped on this is like, I can see how I'm going to benefit from the things that I'm doing now that I'm kind of fit, mentally training myself. Like, cause I'm getting broken almost like four days a week, eight sessions a week. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm getting broken. You know, and I got to get back up and do it again and do it again and do it again. And there's no big like cherry on top at the end of the week. It's a long journey of like gratification. that comes in very like small doses. You may not even recognize very similar to deer hunting, you know, very similar, similar to bow hunting. Well, and what, the, what, what, hold on a second. What is Rogan's yeah. quote about uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? It's, it's high level problem solving with like dire violent. consequences or something or like something. that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. that's, I mean, when you think about deer hunting, when you think about figuring out where the trout are, where the pheasants live, like how to throw the right heel hook, it's all problem solving. Yeah, hundred percent. Like when you think about going for a run when you've never run, or when you wake up and you're tired and it's, you know, you're like, I was gonna do six miles today and I don't want to do it. You got to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Like you just you got to figure out how to do that stuff. And I think that's so. I think it's so beneficial to life and it makes you such a better hunter. Yeah. A hundred, hundred percent. And then, and you're so right because, you know, there's plenty of days where I don't want to go. And there's even days like, I, look, I'll admit it, you know, run a hunting podcast, love hunting, passionate about hunting, but there are days the alarm goes off during hunting season where I'm like, Oh my God. I'm like, <laughs> I would love nothing more than just lay in this bed right now. Um, but the weather is right. The wind is right for this spot. And this is probably the best chance in this spot I'm going to have in the next like week and a half or in the 10 day forecast, I got to get up, you know what I mean? And so, you know, and it's not like it's all, you know, rainbows and unicorns, you know, it's not, but like that old saying of like, you do everything the way you do, or you do anything the way you do everything, you know, or maybe I got that backwards, you know what I mean? But it's like, if I'm a slack ass doing this, I'll eventually think it's okay to be a slack ass doing something else or something else or something else, you know, and it just becomes this cascading effect, just like winning is winning's also a cascading effect. You just got to knock the first chip down, which is the hardest part because the gratification isn't quick. 
it's like it's over time you put the time in then all of a sudden it's like boom it happens and then all of a sudden you start to see yourself stacking wins or stacking accomplishments and then before you know it you're like man i'm doing all the stuff i wanted to do you know and it's not that it's easy but like now there's a momentum and you just keep doing the right thing and it becomes easier well i mean i think that's another great point man it's like we talk about you know we kind of sell this image of of you know bow hunting whitetails is like it's all fun. We love the scouting. We love the shooting. We love the blah, 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 the gear setup and the drive out there. And the reality is like a lot of it sucks. Oh, a hundred percent. A lot of it's not that much fun. You know, like I have people all the time who will say to me, like, I just don't enjoy running like you or lifting weights like you. And I'm like, I actually kind of do enjoy the lifting, but I don't enjoy running at all. Like I, mm-hmm. like, I enjoy how it makes me feel when I've done it. Like I, I yeah. enjoy the, the, the afterglow, right? And it's yeah. the same thing when you look at like most of whitetail hunting. Sure, like scouting can be fun, shed hunting's fun. Like there's there's parts of the work that are fun. It can be fun to go out and fling some arrows, right? Like it can be fun, mm-hmm. but really a lot of it is just kind of work. But you're building up to put yourself in a position where that little bout of fun when he walks out of the cattail slough or whatever, and you see that big deer, like that's that's so fun. It's worth the effort, and it's actually like really you're kind of just tricking yourself into believing that that's going to happen because a lot of times it doesn't, but it's still fun to be out there believing you put those pieces in place. He's probably in there and he might come out. And if you believe that, even if he doesn't come out, you have a pretty good night, you know, or a pretty good sit. And it's like, that's, that's all it is. It's like doing this work to feel something and to have like some reward later. It's not just like, this is all super enjoyable all the time. Like, when you see, I mean, I'm sure you've seen this, but when you go like film some shows and stuff and you spend some time like where it's like a <laughs> real product built around hunting, you're like, there's so much not fun parts of this. Like when I, when I think about like we, we do one week in November, we did it last year and then we filmed, you know, it hasn't, the new season hasn't dropped. It'll drop this year, but we're on a group chat for that. You know, it's Clay and Mark and the whole crew, whatever. And it's seven days of dark to dark sits for a rut rutting buck across the country, whatever. And what you see the final cut, like everybody's having fun. But when you, when you talk to everybody and you see all the, like the little shouting matches between the camera guys and the shooters and stuff, like it's just, there's a lot of not fun there. You know what I mean? That's a kind of a weird example because most people aren't doing that, but like generally you're putting in a, a lot of work for a, uh, what you're just hoping is like a pretty good payoff later. And that's life, man. Like, yeah, that's, that's 100%. why you put away money in your 401k every week. And you want to <laughs> you're like, you're like that freaking payoffs coming, but it might, might not be for 30 or 35 years. Right. Right. Yeah, man. You mentioned something in there that I thought was a, an interesting word choice. And that was belief. Right. Because I think that that is, I think that that's the thing that you have. And that's why when we say, you know, you got to like the process, you know, it's like, and like you said, there's parts of it that just aren't fun. Like there are certain days I go out to scout and I, and I genuinely love scouting. I just like to be out in the woods, I like to take my dog. Like I like to just, what am I going to find over the next hill? Right. But there are some days where it's like, it's a Saturday and, and I'm off and I'm like, man, I'd really rather be laying on the couch because I'm maybe I'm beat up from jujitsu or whatever, but I'm like, it's my only day I got to go get this stuff done, you know, and I know I'll like it and I'll have a good time while I'm out, you know, but it is that belief that it's going to lead to like, maybe not like a buck at the end of the rainbow, but like maybe it's the puzzle piece. I'm going to finally find that helps me start to figure something out. Right. And, and it's the same thing, you know, in jujitsu, it's like, you have to believe you're going to get better because you don't see it every day. You don't see the growth every day, you know? And that was the one thing, like, you know, I talked to like my coach about at one point, because I'm not hell bent on like belts or anything like that. Like I just, I just dig the, I dig the sport of grappling and stuff like that. And it's similar in, it's similar in hunting where, you know, I just said, you know, what do I need to work on to get better? Right. Cause I was like, I feel like I'm, I feel like sometimes I come in and I roll well. And I feel like other times I just come in and just, it's like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. You know, first he was like, well, you're really new at this still technically speaking. He was like, so, you know, it's to be expected. <laughs> you know, So he's like, I was just, you know, calm down. Um, but the other thing was, he was like, don't compare yourself to the guys you're rolling with. For one, he's like, a lot of them have been doing this a while. You know, he's like, you know, and, you know, I wouldn't, you shouldn't expect yourself to compete or beat them, you know, because you just is one of those things where it's like, you really won't ever catch the guy in front of you as long as he stays as consistent as you, because you're both going to develop. 
Now you develop at different kind of rates and stuff like that, but a guy who's like a belt ahead of you, you're likely never going to catch him. The best you can maybe ever do is probably give him a match. You know what I mean? Unless you're like a freak and you just advance quickly. Um, he's like, what you need to do. And he just asked me a really simple question. He's like, could you kick your ass six months ago? And I'm like, yeah, he's like, that's it. You know what I mean? He's like, you would beat Clint from six months ago. And I was like, handily, he was like, then you're progressing. He's like, then you're right where you're supposed to be, you know? And it was like, it's those kind of like little moments that I take. And like, when we, when we talk about, you know, being better to be a better hunter, it's that like, it's not that like getting better at jujitsu is helping me. It's how I'm framing growth mentally. Like how I think about, and this sounds like hoity toity, like some hippy dippy shit, but like how I think about myself is a, is, is, is a lot of it. Right. You know, cause there was, you know, there was some advice that a black belt gave me cause we were rolling and he beat the, I got beat up pretty good. You know, he's a black belt and I, we were messaging each other. And I was like, I said something about being a lowly white belt. And he's like, I don't ever want to hear you refer to yourself like that again. He was like, belts mean absolutely nothing. He was like, if that's how you talk about yourself, he's like, then that's how you, is that, that's what you'll always be. He's like, you have to think it or you have to believe it to be it. He's like, so start thinking that you are better than you're giving yourself credit for. And like, that is so true because it's just like that mental shift makes all the yep. difference in how you, how you kind of, how you frame the output of like a workout or how you frame the output of a hunt or how you frame the output of a conversation with your spouse or how you, it's like, and how you frame almost anything, you know? And so it's just like those little life lessons, man, that like being better at something, whether it's lifting, whether it's running, whether it's jujitsu or whatever it is, will help you with your hunting or just help you in life in general. Cause you start to be able to frame things with the, with the right context that helps you and doesn't hurt you. Yeah, dude, totally. And I, I think when you talk about that and you look at you, so you compare your journey in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to becoming a better whitetail hunter. The, the problem with whitetail hunting is you, you can jump the line and you can't mm. really jump the line in BJJ. No. Like if no. you, if you like, if you go from the couch and you're like, I want to run a, a marathon next year, you can't jump the line. You can't write a big check and suddenly become a really good endurance runner. Like you can't go buy a black belt. It doesn't mean any, like you could, but it doesn't mean anything. Like you're you not. You can, but when you, when you, when you fight someone who has a legit one, like it's, <laughs> there's going to be some exposure. But <laughs> yeah. in hunting, we compare ourselves all the time to people who have jumped the line. And yeah. this is a real problem. Like it, and I'm not saying, you know, like, I don't, I don't care how people hunt. Like, I don't care if you have 4,000 acres of land in Iowa and you kill 200 inches. Great. I'm happy for you. But if you're on the outside looking at that and going, geez, here's somebody who's 24 and they've got a wall full of booners, it's a big deal. Like it doesn't, that doesn't matter to you because you have to follow the path before you to get better at hunting. And it's probably not hunting 4,000 acres of well-managed land in Southern Iowa, right? right? Like, and but we see that all the time and we've really figured out how to hack whitetails. And so people are good at growing them. And people are yeah. good at making those opportunities happen, but there's that world. And then there's the world of people who don't have that. And if you're mm -hmm. not in that world, it's the same process as everything else hard. Like it's not yeah. going to be, you're not going to watch a YouTube video and get, get way better. Like you're going to have to get years of experience doing this to just incrementally level yourself up. Like you talked about with BJJ. And it's like, when you, when you said that, what it reminded me of, you know, I'm super into dogs and I'll, you know, I've got buddies who, you know, I won't see them for six months and then I'll see their dog and I'll be like, man, your dog's really fat. <laughs> like you gotta, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta cut down on the Purina here, buddy. And they'll be like, what do you mean? Cause they look at their dog every day and they yeah. don't see that change. But I looked at that dog in March and then I saw it in October and I go, wow, you know, it's 20% overweight or something like that. But in their head, it's the same dog they see every day. Like it's this stuff, this stuff happens or can happen, whether you can actually kind of see it day to day and acknowledge it day to day or not. And it can go bad or it can go good. And if you're working on the good, it's awesome, but it takes a lot of time. Yeah. And that's where the whole mindset and mind, like how you contextualize and how you think about yourself and your surroundings becomes so, so important, right? Cause it gives you that, that stark reality of where, of where you're at. 
You know what I mean? It, it's like you don't have any delusion. Like I go to the gym and I get on the mat with a buddy of mine who's a purple belt. There's no delusion about the pecking order. You know what I mean? Like it's set out before me pretty quickly. You know what I mean? Just like whenever you're bow hunting, it's like, you know, you don't have delusion about what you have access to and what your, and what your potential is there. You know, it's like, you might be a really good hunter, but you know, you can't kill 170 inch deer if there aren't 170 inch deer. So that, so don't, don't judge yourself against that criteria. Judge yourself against the criteria that actually makes sense for where you're at. Like whatever it is, you know, whatever the uh, top 10% of the, of the top end of, the, of your bucks are, whatever that is, if that's 130 inch deer, then, then that's what you should be. That 130 is the equivalent of the guy who's hunting in, you know, one of those premier states with private ground or whatever, and he's killing 170s. Like you'd be on the same kind of trajectory if you kind of, if you're killing at the same rate, you know what I mean? Like if that, if the same rate is happening, then like you're kind of in the same, in, in the same ballpark, if you will, you know what I mean? Like that's, and that's where I think like contextualizing those things and kind of being honest with yourself about where you're at, what your, what your capabilities are and what the potential is around you, you know, and then just compare yourself to yourself. It's like, what did you do last year? Are you better this year than last year? And like the one thing you can always control is your, is your effort. You know, and it's like, well, maybe things didn't work out for you this year. And there's a lot of circumstances that, that might've, you know, had to do with that. But like, was your effort consistent? Was the effort there? Cause if it is, then at the end of the day, you know, think the chips just didn't fall where you needed them to fall that year. It's just all there is to it. There's not, there's not any, there's not like a big mystery to it. It's just <laughs> that that's what happened, you know? Yeah. And I think sometimes we want to beat ourselves up a little bit more maybe than we should about why this didn't happen or, you know, whatever the case is like, as long as the controllables were controlled to the best of your ability, then, then it is what it is. You know, then you, then you, then you fight harder the next time, you know? Yeah, dude. And I think, I think that in deer hunting, one of the thing, I mean, this is life too, but one of the things that we don't acknowledge or, or give enough thought to is how often we settle and how that makes mm-hmm. us not enjoy it. Like I know, Part of the reason I like going over the road and hunting new public land somewhere versus hunting a lot of stuff that I've hunted for a long time is because it's so easy for me to default to a spot or a stand when I'm, when I'm in that situation and go, you know, man, it's the right conditions. Maybe somebody's going to come through this spot and I'll get in there and I'll be like, I just talked myself into this because it's here and it's easy and I don't mm. feel great about it. You know what I mean? And it, yeah. when you go on the road, you're like, I feel like I settle less where I'm like, I'm, I'm working to figure something out. So I feel like I, I have so many setups where I don't feel like I'm going to kill, but I'm going to learn something and it's going to put me like a, a step ahead. But there's a lot of times when I'm at home and I go to a farm I've hunted for a long time or, you know, some chunk of public where I'm like, I'm just going to go in here because sometimes it happens here. And I almost always feel like I just settled and it, it's no good. And I think, I think when you look at your hunting situation, if you're like, I'm not enjoying this part of the process. A lot of times it's because you're just settling for what you think, you know, or you think you should do without trying to figure out maybe there's a, maybe there's a better path right before you for tonight or for this week. Right. I wonder what that is, man. Cause it's, it, I'll walk into a place sometimes and I'll have an area that maybe I've hunted in the past and maybe it's a couple hundred yards away or whatever. And I'm going to just kind of go to another kind of section and it's like a freaking magnet. I'll be scouting around, be like, all right, I'm not going to hunt that spot today. I'm going to scout this edge. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to check this out. And then I'm going to find a setup, you know? And like, I'll be damned if I don't end up like within 50 yards of of like where that tree's at, you know what I mean? To where it's one thing if the, if the sign continually leads you back there, you know what I mean? That's, that's one thing, right? Cause then maybe it's like, well, Hey, you know, I have a spot there. The signs point me in that direction. Like don't look a gift horse in the mouth, you know? trust your gut if that's where it's telling you to be like we were talking about earlier but otherwise it's like do you think it's just like that comfort of like or the um the the romanticism of living out something you've already imagined or maybe even something that's happened previously that you want to revisit i think we're just genetically programmed for easy like i mean i think it's a, a mental component like the same thing like when you're really hungry you go for the most calorie dense food which is always shit like it's always junk food right (laughs) because your body is like give me the most calories as fast as possible and i think this thing is like a a mental version of that where we're just like it's easy 
Like, I don't have to think about this. I don't have to second guess anymore. I just know, like, sometimes I see deer there or there's usually a community scrape on this logging road and I'm going to go set up over it. And, you know, like, if if you feel good about that and that's the kind of hunting you do and you enjoy it, that's great. Like, you're going to kill some deer or whatever. But if you're sitting there and there's, like, that nagging thought in your head and you're like, I don't, I don't want to be here because I don't believe it. I talk myself into doing something and I don't believe it. That sucks. And it, right. we see this, dude, I see this in the fishing world all the time where people will get like really locked into a certain style of fishing. And it's just like, I'm going to force these fish to eat a spinnerbait no matter what. And it's like, nope, it's just like, it's just not going to work. <laughs> like you're going to figure out that you, you made the wrong choice. And we do that with hunting all the time. And it's part of it is because it, any given sit is not that consequential right? Like mm -hmm. there's always tomorrow or there's always my rutcation or whatever. So it's like, no, oh, if I go settle on this sit, big deal, I wasted one night in October, but it's not about that. Like, it's about, you know, like, do you feel good about it? Like, are you enjoying it? Like, are you sitting there? Like, I think, I think I made the right call tonight. Like I, like this is a cool setup. I've never been here before. Or, you know, instead of going to that default spot, like I'm going to go down to the Creek bottom below and I'm going to walk it. I'm just going to set up on a crossing for the hell of it. Like, what, mm -hmm. what do you need to like really enjoy it? And I think a lot of times we don't, we don't trust ourselves that way. We just like, I got to go do what I always go do. Right. Yeah. It's, that, that's interesting, man. Cause like there's definitely places that I like to hunt that have, that have been decent just because, and it, not, not that they were easy necessarily, but like what you had just said there, where I just like to be there. You know what I mean? It's like, and it's just one of those things where, and it's not a place necessarily that I'll, I'll be drawn to, um, like a, a bunch of times during the course of the year, it'll be like a specific time of year, like this one spot, like the way it just kind of unfolds. Like I just, I like to be in that spot, you know, and maybe I've seen some deer there in the past or whatever, but there's usually like the places where I have my best hunts or in those places where I just want to be, you know, and I don't know. It's like, it's part of that idea of like, you kind of you know, willing it into fruition, you know what I mean? Like the place just got good vibes. You feel good about it. You feel confident. So there's probably an element to like, you feel confident in it. So you're, you're way more, you're way more keyed in. So you're being that much more quiet. You're being that much more still. You're being that much more observant, right? Like all those things, you know, it's that, it's that attention to detail. And it goes back to like, again, I hate bringing it back up, but like the whole mindset thing of like just being locked in. You know what I mean? Like if you're just, if you approach things locked in all the time, like every one of the, every setup could be like that, yeah. you know, but there's so many times where we're like, it'll be like, well, oh, I'm just going to go set up here because the wind's not right for the spot that I want to be in. The wind's okay for here. So I'm just going to throw a set at it and that's okay to burn. I have a burner spot, but like if that burner spot could have been the spot, but like your approach to it was that it's a burner spot. It's like whenever I said I was a lowly white belt, the black belt was like, don't refer to yourself that way. Cause that's all you'll ever be. You know, if you, if you refer to that spot as like, Oh, that's my other killing spot. How do you approach getting in and out of that spot and how your how much attention to detail you have while you're hunting that spot? If that's how you think about it. Yeah. Well, and I mean, and you're right too, man. Like some areas you just want to sit cause they just, they work for you. Like some spots mm -hmm. you just, you just like, like I have, I have places that I just always want to hunt every year just cause I enjoy being there. But I'm always like hyper aware of going into an area like that and, you know, like talking myself into it when it's obvious things have changed. And this, this is like a big problem. Like, you know, this is, well, I mean, it's part of the reason why like food plots and the kind of, the kind of hunting that you see a lot is so popular. If you can mm -hmm. guarantee consistency from year to year and you don't have to think too hard about where you're going to go because you're always going to go sit in the, you know, the box blind on the clover. Like that's a yeah. pretty easy way to go about things, right? Like that's not likely to change a ton from year to year. It's pretty, pretty consistent. But when you talk mm -hmm. about walking into the mountains out in PA or somewhere and you're like, I love this spot, like you might go back and have five years of deer action there. And then somebody, one person figures it out and everything right. changes or some logging activity or some browse or soft mass or something. And you just, you look at it and go, I want to hunt here so bad. I'm going to hunt here. Even when you put in some time and you're like, they're showing me they're not here anymore. Like that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Cause right. that, that is like maybe the hardest thing 
that I had to learn when I was like, I'm, I'm going to figure out how to kill big bucks on public land was that what I did this year probably doesn't matter next year as far as where I killed one. Like specifically, sometimes you can go back and get close. Sometimes you can mm-hmm. do the same thing, but it was almost always something changed. And so I would go back and be like, there's my comfort spot. And then after two days, I'm like, this place sucks now and I don't know why. Or I might know why. <laughs> and I, again, I'm throwing that spinnerbait when I should be throwing a drop shot or something. Like, I just look at it and go, I, I want this to happen. I'm forcing right. this to happen. And it's just like, Mother Nature's like, no, man, We're, we got yeah. a different program going on. You better start figuring it out. Yeah. Yeah, man. 100%. It's a. Uh... I think life's kind of that way too, that we're having like, we're having like kind of a, a therapy session on today's podcast. <laughs> you know, it's a, uh, you know, it, and just going back to what we were talking about earlier, like the, the idea of efficiency, you know, and, you know, jujitsu being, you know, a lot about efficiency. It's like, you never for like the really, really good guys. And like, I would say even like the really, really good hunters, this is again, where I see parallels, the really, really good jujitsu guys rarely ever force anything. Like it's always, they don't fall into stuff. They lay traps. You know what I mean? Like they're laying, they're doing this because you're going to react this way. And they're thinking three moves ahead, right? Just like really good bow hunters. It's like, they're thinking three moves, five moves ahead. And they're never forcing the issue. It's always that these three things are going to fall in place. And then this is when the opportunity is going to arise. Right. And so it's a lot, it's a lot the same way. It's like when you're forcing things, you're just using unnecessary energy to probably get not the result you're looking for. You know, it's, it's a lot. I I mean, I say easy and it is to a degree if you just let things come to you, but you've got to be really open and willing to get outside your comfort zone and do things that maybe you haven't done before, you know what I mean? Or Or hunt somewhere where you haven't hunted before or try a tactic you've never tried before or, whatever the case is. And you may not be great at it the first time, but it's like, that's how you let things just kind of come to you. Dude, you're so right. Like there, there's a pacing aspect to hunting. That's like really hard to, it's, it's like a really hard concept to pass along. And you're like, mm-hmm. you think, you know, if you watched you know, you go watch a hunting public video, right? Like it's going to look like those guys are just burning all the time. Yeah. Right. Yep. But you're seeing a sizzle reel. 20 minute, 40 minute show, whatever. And you're not seeing where the patience comes into play. And this is something, you know, like we, we've kind of continually sold this message, especially in the last 10 years of the public land thing. Like it's always go, go, go. But there's a time for that. And there's a time where you go, I got here. Now I need to let this play out. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you're super into music. You play guitar, like, I, I watched an interview with David Gilmore one time from Pink Floyd. And he was talking about producing an album and he was talking about how he just learned to let the music breathe instead of trying to fill in everything all the time and have all these different elements and just let things play out and like, and give them the, the right pacing. And I think about that all the time where it's like, you know, you, you go show up like if, typically if I show up at a place I've never hunted before, I'm going to, I'm going to burn some miles quick. Like mm-hmm. I'm going to go look at, I'm going to have, <laughs> you know, eight, 10 waypoints and I'm going to see them all. And then I'm going to find something where I'm like, this is my number one spot. And I'm going to give that some time. And if, if the deer show me that it's worth five days to be there, I, I, okay, I'm going to settle in and I'm going to sit five all day sits or whatever. Or if not, I'm gone. And, you know, like when you, when you start to think about that stuff and it's like, you, you kind of look at it and go, you, you brought this up earlier. Like, should you, you know, should you let something breathe a little bit and wait for it to get right? Or should you rush in there? And in deer hunting, we rush in way too often. Like people go and they find something and they go, Oh, all the rubs are here now. It's like, okay, like that's a good find, but are the conditions telling you that this is like the daylight movement is going to happen for you tonight? Or are you looking at the seven day forecast going, listen, I'm going to get this four days from now, even though I could hunt tonight and tomorrow night and the next night, like, are you going to go to that backup spot or are you going to just rush in there and cross your fingers? And I think we do that yeah. all the time. And it's, <clears throat> I don't think you can learn that without just screwing up so much and yeah. having you know those bad sits in places you have a lot of confidence in. Yeah. I mean, I think the music analogy was awesome. That was perfect. Cause like, as soon as you said it, 
there was an interview. I think it was an interview I either read or I listened to um, with uh, Danny Carey, who's a uh, tools drummer. Right. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a huge drum freak. Like I'm a it's guitar player, but like drummer in the world. Right. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, it's, he's, inc- he's incredible. But like yeah. my wife makes fun of me. Cause like, I wish I were a drummer. Cause I will sit and fall down the, the wormhole on YouTube of just like drumming videos. Like you got to check out the dude. I forget his name now, but he's like, he's a, the official drummer for nine inch nails, but watch him play like the nine inch nails set live. And it's like one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. Like he's playing all that program stuff and the guy's playing piano at the same time. Like it's just incredible. But back to the point that you made, they were asking Danny Carey about his playing style because he's just, he's incredible. And he said, I forget what question they asked. It was something I'm going to mess this up. Cause I don't remember. It's been so long, but it was something along the lines of like, in a lame way, like, why are you so good? <laughs> you know, that was essentially what someone was asking. And he was like, it's not the notes I play. He's like, it's the space in between the notes that I play that are the most important, you know? And that was just like, and at that time when I saw that or read it, that was when I was in the band and doing stuff a lot. And so I really kind of took that to heart and it started making a lot of sense to me. It's like, when you give things the opportunity to breathe, you get the full effect of whatever that thing is. And so if you let a spot breathe and you show some patience and you strike when the time is right, you get the full effect of that spot, you know, and I had this happen to me this year in Kansas because, you know, last year, you know, 21, I was out there and had an encounter with a really good deer, a couple good deer, but like the one really, really close encounter, you know, whatever it was 15 yards with that buck and just didn't get it done. My setup wasn't right. And, you know, and just didn't have the wind the way it needed to be. And, you know, just mistakes. Right. And, um, went back this year and, and part of it was last year, the previous year, like Chad and I blew a couple opportunities by being over aggressive, you know, cause we were out there to like white tail adrenaline it. Like we were decoying, like rushing in on bedded deer, like, you know, like the whole night. And we kicked deer out of beds and, you know, and it was a cool experience, but it was a learning experience. And then I went back this year and I kind of understood the game a little bit. The whole first day I sat there, I just glassed the whole day. Like from like, I got there before daybreak and I sat there and I didn't make a single move until probably three o'clock in the afternoon. That was when I got out of the truck and I didn't see what I wanted to see in the area. I was glassing. So there was a second spot where I knew some deer like to spend time and where we watched a big deer kind of walk into the year prior. So I went back and I saw a couple of does and I was just really patient. The next day I went to this head of this draw and saw a hammer deer, but he was like 200 yards away and I couldn't get him to turn. And, but I left him alone. Cause I was like, mm, he's going to be back in like four or five days once he's off that doe. And by the end of this trip, I should have another play at him. And I didn't rush in there and like booger the spot up or whatever. I blew another opportunity on a different deer. And I've told that story a hundred times, but the moral of the story was is I waited to the very last day of the trip and went back to that spot. And I ended up meeting that deer in the dark at like 25 yards. We both went to the same tree at the same time. And I got hung out the dry. I couldn't get a shot off at him, ended up not killing him and ended up having to watch him walk away. And it was a big deer, but like, it was that patience that actually put me there. I could have went and did that multiple days, but the fact that I let that spot breathe and I knew when to time it, it was like, you know, now I'm like, well, what are the odds that that deer shows up the exact same tree I'm going to at the exact same time in the dark, in the morning, you know what I mean? Like yep. never happens. Right. But I mean, that's a good example of, of, of letting things breathe. But, uh, you mentioned, you know, people kind of seeing videos and like rushing in, you know, especially around public, like we've sold this kind of idea, maybe, you know, um, unintentionally around like aggressive, 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 but I'm curious from you, man, like, do you see the pendulum swinging back toward private at some point? Or what do you think the state of like public land hunting is right now? I think, I think we're probably going to be on a little bit of a decline in popularity now. I mean, I think part of it is going to, we're going to just be forced. I mean, if you see, you know, Nebraska's limiting tags, South Dakota just announced that they're going to limit tags. Like you're seeing the Western license thing come East and, you know, it'll be a while before it gets to your neck of the woods, but it's coming. And I think that we're just, you know, it got so popular for so long and everybody was out doing it. And then you've got, you know, the, the trophy aspect of everybody trying to lease everything and lock up ground. And so that pushes more people onto public. And I think it's just kind of hit a fever pitch, you know, with COVID and the whole thing. And I hope it's just sort of going to level off now, you know? And mm-hmm. I, I mean, 
And I say that like just purely selfishly. Like I'm like, I hope it's just kind of like finds an equilibrium. I don't know if it will, but right. I also hope we kind of look at this. And, you know, I mean, there's so much bitching out there about non-residents and too many hunters and this stuff. And I don't, I don't want to be in that camp. And so I always look at this and go, okay, if, even if this public land thing sort of, you know, maintains this equilibrium and it's like, it doesn't grow anymore. If it doesn't go down a whole lot. We still need more public land. Like the answer to so many of our problems is these walk-in programs and getting more land open to the public. It's not just well, you live across the state line, so screw you. You're going to pay 14 times right. what I pay, and you're going to draw a tag, and we're going to keep you out, and you're not going to hunt this month. And it's it's not taking away opportunities from other hunters. Like That is not the game we're going to play to get ahead here. Like You can, in the short term, try to get easier hunting for yourself by advocating for that, and people are doing that all over. But in the long run, we do not want to take away opportunities. Like we, right. I think it's such a bad idea so we like we have to look at this and go what what options do we have then like we need more land like we just need more of it like even even if the public land hunting the popularity goes downhill and there's fewer people out there we're still just with urban sprawl and everything we still need land for everybody to enjoy and i just think yeah. we gotta like, we have to focus on that because it's too easy to sit there in your state and go i don't want anybody else coming here and i'm gonna bitch to the dnr and they're gonna they're going to limit other hunters from coming in here because it's my state and I pay taxes here. I'm like, that's a bad, it's, we're, we're going to pay for this. Like my kids are going to pay for this movement in a way that sucks. Like they're not mm -hmm. going to get to go hunting the way we can. And it's, I just don't, I don't think it's necessary. Right. So that was a so bad, you... that was a rant way off topic. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I think, I think, you know, you hit it in a, in a roundabout way. I mean, I think, you know, what I was, thinking about is just, you know, this year was probably, you know, Pennsylvania is a high pressure state, just generally speaking. Right. Um, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's up there in like the top three, like probably in the country, you know, as far as like hunters per square mile and stuff like that. Um, and this year was like probably the worst I'd ever seen it. Uh, at least for me locally, I had more people walk in on me on places that were like, off the beaten path. I'm like, mm, you know what I mean? I had more people carrying like stick bows, stealth hunting, like, and not, not older folks. Like usually like in the past, if I saw someone with a stick, bow, it was usually like an older guy carrying a stick bow. You know, this was like yep. younger guy, like late twenties, early thirties, you know, you know, uh, like on the ground trying to sneak through brush. But it was just like, I, I heard him from a mile away. And I actually could smell his clothes detergent and he had the wind at his back. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> like, there was a lot wrong with the, with, with what was going on. You know what I mean? Like, and so I'm seeing more and more of, of, of that type of stuff where I'm going, you know, it made me pause for a second and go, maybe I buy a farm, you know, what I mean? like maybe I was like, maybe I'm at a point in my life where, you know, it's a good investment. I buy a farm somewhere, you know, maybe next door to my dad, whatever. We work that little piece together, whatever, you know, that was like a fleeting thought for about a day and a half. Cause I was pissed off, but it made me stop and think, you know, I have the, the fortune that I can travel to hunt and I'm willing to do some traveling, like to get a couple hours away to get to bigger pieces where I have a little bit more, you know, freedom and, and less people and stuff like that. But for people who just don't have the flexibility that I have and stuff like that, and that's like their total reality, like that's that's tough, man. Because like locally this year, just the pressure alone wasn't great. Like it made for like a not great, yeah. not enjoyable situation. You know, when when most times I was going out that I was getting walked in on, you know, morning, evening, week, weekend, didn't matter, you know. And that's a tough pill to swallow. You know what I mean? Like where you get like, especially the guy who gets like, three days to go out during the course of the year or four days. It's like, you know, you don't blame that guy for going like, why am I buying a tag? Yeah. You know? Well, I know that that's a tough one. Cause that's, I mean, when you hear people bitching about like Colorado elk hunting, it's not like there aren't an, enough acres of public land and elk. To right. go around. There are like people there who are. tell you that there aren't, they're, they're not working that hard. 
The problem with it is, is everybody who goes elk hunting has the idea that I'm going to cover 10 miles every day. And so there's just so much ground being covered. And, mm-hmm. you know, when you talk about hunting public land, it's it, for whitetails. It's not the guy who goes out and sits in a stand somewhere. It's always the guys who are walking around trying to walk one down. And, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, you can't, it's public land. They can do what they want. Right. But yeah. that's like, that's the hardest thing to deal with. And it, it does feel I like, I felt, you know, over in Wisconsin, they legalized crossbows. Some of the States I hunt crossbows are legal. I felt like maybe, and maybe this is like a personal bias of mine, but I'm like, man, when people get a crossbow in their hands, it feels like they want to cover ground. Like if I see a guy mm-hmm. walking around a lot of times, he's not carrying a stick bow, he's carrying a crossbow. And it's like, I'm going to go pick one up on the edge of the field at you know, half hour before dark and shoot it. And it's just, drives you freaking crazy but it's like yeah oh they like they're using public land like you are you know like you yeah gotta go you know do i hunt in i mean it, but that goes you know we've been dealing with that i've been dealing with that my whole life when i've been hunting public land and it's part of the reason why i hunt a lot in the rain and i'm a lot when it's 100 degrees out like yeah. that guy's not gonna go walk around with that stick bow if it's 90 degrees <laughs> and if no. you have a little pond tucked back somewhere like that could be your ticket you know or if yeah. it's pouring rain for three days or just, you know, like you, there's just things you got to work around it. Cause that's just a part of it. But yeah. And I, I don't know, man, like kind of to go back to that question, I got way derailed on. Like, I think we're in a, we're in like a, the top of a wave of trophy hunting again. And we saw this. It's like, I, when I was at Peterson's bow hunting and you know, like that, you know, magazines were really hot then. Right. And the network hunting shows were really hot then. That was when like, you know, Bone Collector and Lee and Tiff and the whole, like everybody was just blowing up. And you saw this trophy wave follow it, like just so hard. Like now, you know, 140s are junk and now we need 170s. And now 170s are junk and you need 200 inchers and we can't help ourselves. But these waves come and go, they crash. And the last time this one crashed, a guy named Steve Ranella came in and said, I'm going to talk about eating deer and freaking enjoying hunting and trapping. And, you know, Randy Newberg came in and then all of a sudden mm-hmm. the hunting public guys come in and you, you fill that void where people are like, you know, this, this is bullshit. Like I'm not growing 200 inch deer and supplemental feeding them and have, you know, $150,000 John Deere tractors to plant food plots. Like I'm just a hunter. And so then we embrace kind of this new wave of like, this is about the experience and this is about challenging yourself, but we just can't help ourselves. And pretty soon it's like mm-hmm. that 120 inch on public land isn't big enough and it's got to be a 140 and a 150. And now you're seeing, you know, booners like, and it's like, well, I think we're at another peak again. And I don't know. Mm-hmm. I felt like I kind of saw this one come and that's kind of why I went into the public land thing, like partially for business. I don't know what we do next. Like, I don't know if this one's going to break and we're going to have some kind of, renaissance with something else but i hope so like i hope we kind of back off of this trophy bullshit a little bit and go can we just talk about the experience like can we can we not like buck shame people if they go out and shoot 110 inch or like that's crazy like that's a great deal right. but we just can't help ourselves yeah i i just wonder like i have a hard time thinking of like what the next evolution is because i saw like you know, I saw the public thing kind of coming, you know, like I don't want anyone to see, see, think that I feel like I'm Nostradamus here or something like that. But like, you know, if you went back on my YouTube channel, like before the hunting public put out a public land video, I had public land scouting videos out, (laughs) you know what I mean? So it was like, before that even happened, like I was already kind of, and I saw it coming. So I knew that I wanted to, I knew like, just like from a podcast perspective, I was like, huh, these people are more like me, I should focus more on this because there's a lot of people out there that are doing the same stuff I'm doing. Cause I wasn't talking a lot about it when it first started. Like it was a lot of working on our family farm and stuff like that. But then I've, what happened was, is I wasn't having the experience that I wanted. And so I was like, I need to like have less boundaries and more space to roam. And that was really why I jumped toward public land was before that experience. And I have a hard time kind of seeing like where the pen, how the pendulum swings next, you know what I mean? Because like, cause I feel like public land is so hunting is so prevalent right now and popular or, or interesting or, or it gives people the experience that they're looking for or whatever the case is. But I do at the same time, I think it's, it's, it's really kind of a dichotomy, right? Because before when we had like the trophy hunting thing, it was a lot of like 
like you said, like Lee and Tiffany, like the managed farms, the Drury's, right? It was like, it was that, like we're farming bucks, right? And then the public land stuff came in, you know, like you, with all the people that you mentioned to kind of go, hey, like the experience of public land is cool and this land doesn't necessarily suck to hunt. You can find good bucks and you can have good experiences and do what, whatever your fancy is, you can tickle it here, yeah. right? And so now you have both of these things that I feel like you have the trophy thing, was, which is kind of like at a, that's peaking again. But you also have public land that's like peaking at this, like peaking at the same time, and so there's not this public land experience thing to run to because it's already happening. But the, yeah. but the trophy thing is infiltrating like the public piece now too, and so now like people that aren't watching this, like my hands, I've now gone out of the screen, like I've run out of room, <laughs> like the, uh, you know, and so I'm always, I'm just, I think to myself, I'm like, where does this, where does this thing go next? Like, how do you? recalibrate things again like is it are we all of a sudden just going to be like screw this we're all going to start pheasant hunting at tony's place <laughs> my place is your place too because it's all public buddy <laughs> but you know what i mean it's like what's the thing that you what 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 is the thing that people run to that and i don't say run to in a bad way but like what is the the place that gives them that same kind of feeling or experience but isn't you know trophy white tails on public land or on managed properties. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if we go to more of a, like a general hunting experience for like, I, you know, I'm going to hunt rabbits this week and I'm going to hunt whatever next week. And yeah, I hunt deer some, I don't know. I don't know where we go with it. Like we're so, I think we're in a really bad spot right now with it because like you said, we, the trophy thing has really infiltrated the public land thing. And that's a bad it's a bad place to be because it's, mm -hmm. it's almost a certainty that everybody who goes and hunts public land is not going to kill a trophy buck. Like it, right. it was almost a certainty on, on private land. And it's just like, that's the wrong way to look at it. Like it's, that's not where oh. the value in having public land lies to me, you know? Right. And then I think then it's also kind of then used against us to a degree because like you inevitably, you know, well, what they'll say is you start to have conflict, right? Cause that was one of the things I listened to like some of the stuff that our, my buddies from Exodus did when they talked about the, 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 the trail camera ban in Kansas. Right. And I didn't get to listen to the whole, whole thing. I was doing something. I got to jump in like the last bit of their live stream, but like, you know what? I, I think they had claimed during that like minutes meeting or whatever in, in Kansas was like, there's, you know, to reduce hunter, hunter conflict was the, was the idea, right. was one of the ideas. Right. And I was like, all right, yeah, in Kansas, you want to see Hunter Hunter conflict, like go to New Jersey, like yeah. and watch two <laughs> two dudes throw down over a corn pile. You know what I mean? Like, they, but you know, so my point being is like, not that that's a valid thing. I'm just using this as an example because you can imagine, you know, a a situation where trophy deer are like the the thing, right? And it's infiltrated public land, and now you have more competition. You know. Uh, possessiveness of an area becomes even even height more heightened. Like I had my stand here, like in June, and this guy put one fifty yards for me, and like have this like issue, right? And then the powers that be, if it becomes prevalent, can then start to use that against you to then start to shape policy, yep. right? Whether it becomes banning trail cameras, whether it becomes reducing tags, you know, whether it becomes you know increasing tag prices to reduce the number of people who would be willing to come in to hunt a certain state, uh, reducing the, you know, and just Kansas as an example, since I'm there, you know, not that I'm not physically there, but since, you know, I'm talking about it, they reduce like the Weha, like, you know, uh, folks that can enroll into the Weha program, like any number of things they can use against, you know, based on our behavior or presumed behavior. Right. And it doesn't even have to be true. It just has to be an image or a perception. Yep. Well, and it, listen, man, yeah, this goes back to what we talked about before. Like, okay, you look at most of the people listening to this probably don't care that they ban trail cameras on public land in Kansas, right? Doesn't affect right. probably most right. people. the The problem is the trend is always to just take away. Like, yeah. oh, you you think you know you, you're hearing from residents and they're bumping into too many people on public land. Take away the non residents opportunities, right? Oh, there's hunter conflicts on public land in Kansas take away trail cameras like that's going to solve anything this is it's so right. dumb but the problem is you take away that stuff it never comes back and it's not mm -hmm. going to fix these problems you think those people in kansas are going to be way happier hunting public land now it's not going to change anything 
Like you think, oh, if you're in South Dakota and now, you know, there's only going to be 2,200 non-residents hunting versus 4,000 or 6,000. Like in three years, you're going to be bitching about those 2,200 and the other residents you see on there. It's People are never going to get happy over this stuff. And so I look at it again. I go, okay, if your problem is hunter conflicts on public land in Kansas, how about we figure out how to get that WEHA program bigger? Like. Right. What if we raise license prices for the non-residents again, because we've proven we'll screw non-residents no matter what with license right. prices, and we take that money and we go, we're going to sweeten the deal here for these landowners. We're going to get more mm -hmm. land out there because a way to reduce hunter conflicts is to give them more places to hunt. Like, yeah. it, it, but we never do that. We always just look at, like, what's the easiest way to, like, fix this? You know, it's like, I always bring this up. You know, we hunted for years in northern Wisconsin – for the January grouse season there. I mean, it was it, their grouse season just went through January, but here in Minnesota, it ends on de December 31st. It was always like a nice bonus hunt, right? Like you could go over there mm -hmm. a couple weekends and hunt grouse. And we did it like two weekends a year for like 10 years. And I, all public land, almost all public land, I never saw another hunter in 10 years of hunting. Once in a while, you'd see some tracks on a logging road or something, but I never saw a single other hunter and when the grouse numbers started to tank a little bit, the first thing they did was took away the, the January hunt. And mm -hmm. you're like, does this have any basis on the resource? Because I don't see anybody else but me and my two buddies killing birds in December. Like, And I know that's like an anecdotal thing, but it wasn't backed by like, well, there's X amount of 100 hours, you know, 100 hours devoted to this, and they're killing this many birds. It's just like, here's an easy thing to make people happy, make the residents happy. And it doesn't really affect too much, so we'll just take it away. Did it change the grouse numbers? No. Like, will we ever get it back? No. It's just gone, and it's not coming back. You can see this with some stuff like in Minnesota, we had a moose hunt forever. It's gone. It's never coming back. Like, you're never going right. to get it back. And these, you know, you see this out west. I get really freaking fired up about this stuff when, like, you look at, like, Colorado and Wyoming, and, and residents in some of those states are, like, really anti-non-resident now. And I get it. But I'm like, man, if you start taking away like opportunities from people, like you have a funding issue, you have a, a smaller voice, and you're living in states where lots of non-hunters are going there, somebody's mm -hmm. going to pay for this wildlife eventually, somehow. And if it's not hunters, you're in trouble. And that's what's going to yeah. happen. They're going to have to backfill this revenue somewhere. It's like, it just it's such dangerous ground. It just it drives me crazy. Yeah, it's... Uh it's a shame that like that stuff becomes, you know, I don't want to say politicized isn't the right word, but it's that it's, uh, that there's a game being played with it, I guess is, is one way to say it. Right. Because it's never, it's never what it's looks like at face value. There's always something kind of behind it. Right. It's like, I don't know why the real reason is, is why they, why they banned cell cameras or trail cameras in, um, in Kansas, but I can promise you it has very little to do with actual hunters. If you, if you really get down to like the cut of their jib, someone somewhere is paying somebody for something. We just don't know what yet. Yeah. Well, and you know, I mean, you know, in that situation, that's, that was a weird one. That meeting, it was, like oftentimes, and this is, this is a problem we have throughout the country is like you get people in the fishing game departments who don't, they're not end users, right? Like, oh, their, their answers to things were amazing. Like, I don't know what these cameras are. Like, then what are you doing making decisions about how they're being used? I it's brutal, but that's like, listen, if that can ha happen in Kansas, it can happen. Oh anywhere. yeah. Like I don't, your well, state's not immune from that. I don't care. Like you're one hire away or one, you know, turnover generation away at your game and fish to have like stuff like that. And it's just so it's, it's like so crazy. And I, I mean, it, if, if there's a state out there that's like, Hey, we're going to ban cellular cameras because we've always had you know no wireless communication or whatever and there's like a clear like it's like this we feel this is a violation of our fair chase principles or whatever like a clear precedent a precedent that has been set sure. and then it, and then they're right. like and, and you know and they say that and they go listen no usage during the season you can use them all summer long or off season or whatever what like it's it's hard to argue against that because it comes from a place of like logic where you're like, right. I, I, I might disagree with it because I don't think it really matters, but right. it, I could at least see their point and go, okay, like I understand where you're coming from. When you look at like the, that Kansas thing, I go, 
you don't even have a clue what you're talking about. And and how many hunter conflicts are you are we talking about? Like, I mean, how many possible hunter conflicts are coming up because of? Well, that's what I that's what I said because I was like, I was like, you're talking about a state that doesn't like. <clears throat> You're not talking about an area like Pennsylvania where you have 800, 900,000 hunters, 700,000, I think was like on the low end one here, but you know, yeah. call it close to 800,000 on average, all with a firearm during deer season for the most part. Cause those are by and large, you know, rifle deer hunters buying tags, right? Yep. If there were ever going to be any significant hunter conflict, it would be in a place like that. You would think, you know what I mean? Not in a place like Kansas, which everybody there owns land for the most part, right? Like that's just like what it is. It's all big, like huge farms. You know what I mean? So I can't imagine. I didn't see, I don't think the entire time I was out there, I don't think I saw a single local person hunting Weeha. Now I saw some trucks with Kansas plates that were like near, like on some Weeha. I could probably count all in the, in the two trips that I spent there. I spent a total of three weeks there the past two years. I can probably count on one hand the number of trucks I saw with Kansas plates parked at Weehaw. You yep. know what I mean? So it's not like it's not like there's a ton of like locals hunting a lot of these spots would be my would be my thinking, right? And even so, like in those areas, like the hunter like the population density is so low. Like you just don't even see people when you go to the grocery store. Like <laughs> Like where humans usually go, there aren't people. So I find it hard to believe they all seem to meet up in a CRP field somewhere. Yep. Well, I know. And, it, you know, I know that there are residents, you know, hunting private land who don't care about that. Right. They're like, good, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, cause it's mo cause you're right. It's mostly non-residents hunting there. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you make a connection there and you go, okay, let's say that somebody does make the argument that too many hunter conflicts or, it is like there is a question of like fair chase involved there somewhere. Like what if that what if that becomes part of the tenant for getting rid of it? And you're in a state like Kansas where you can drive a dump truck full of corn onto your land right. and dump it on the ground and sit over it. So now you've banned something else because it may be, you know, maybe it's questionable with the fair chase. And yet you're sitting over, you know, a 55 gallon drum of corn dumped out there. And it's like, well, they're not coming for me. I'm a resident and I'm hunting private land. It's like, maybe not yet, but like, I would right. be really careful about that stuff. That's just it. It's like, they're not coming for you yet. Right. You just gave them precedent yeah. to start to take, to take things away. Right. And like you said, it's like when they start to take stuff away, they don't, they don't give it back, you know, or if they do, yep. you're going to pay a hefty price to get it back. It's going to cost you way more than what it costs them to take it, you know, essentially. So if Tony Peterson could change one thing about hunting, what would it be? Oh man. Tony's president or Joey. you're, you're the, you're the grand poobah of hunting. <laughs> like in the Flintstones, you're the grand poobah of hunting. What would you change? Do you know, do you know what I fantasize about sometimes for hunting? This is, oh, I was going to say you better, 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 better categorize this to just hunting. Cause I could get, I could get real weird with this. <laughs> <laughs> I if I had a magic wand and I could, I'm not saying I would do this, but I think about this sometimes. Like when I'm running, I start I go deep into this like kind of daydreaming. I mm -hmm. think about what it what the white tail scene would look like if all of a sudden none of the deer had antlers for like three years. Like that would what be would amazing. happen? Like I mean, first off, what we uh, you would know do what? is immediately start weighing our does, right? <laughs> like we immediately would be start like, weighing them. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, it would be like, oh, I killed a hundred, yeah, hundred fifty-seven pound doe this year. Like, I mean, instantly we would figure out a way to sort of make them trophies. But I just wonder what it would do to us if all of a sudden the antler thing was just off the table, right? So now you you can go hunt. You could kill a six and a half year old buck, and you could see, you know, like, but he doesn't have the antlers. Or you could just go out and hunt for meat. Like, I, I wonder how that would change us. And I think about that a lot, like with Western hunting too. Like, I'm like, man, what if all the elk just didn't have antlers for like three years? What would, how many people would still go into the backcountry and do it? Cause a lot would, like, I actually think a mm -hmm. lot of people would still go hunting. And I think a lot of people would actually go, you know what? It's kind of a relief. Cause now I'm just going out here and I want to put one or two in the freezer or whatever. And I'm waiting for that good shot. And there isn't like, oh, here comes the 107 inch down the trail that I absolutely want to kill. 
but I don't want to get destroyed on social media when I post it. And I definitely want to post my kill photo. So I'm like, I, I kind of fantasize about that. Like, I'm like, what would we, how would we be? Cause you wouldn't see this bullshit with like, Oh, there's too many people on public land and there's too much of this. And like these non-residents are shooting all of our forkies. Like, I think it would be a fun experiment. I know obviously it can't happen, but if I had a magic wand and I could do that, man, I think, I don't know. Dude, that I might is. Wave it. I might pull Harry Potter spells out of my ass and wave that sucker. Dude, that is brilliant. Like, and I think you're 100 percent right. We would start weighing our does, and I think that I really want to make a T-shirt that says 150 pound, 150 pound doe on like a on like a buck pole. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I really want to make that shirt. <laughs> and uh, and like at the, at the bottom in quotes, Tony Peterson. You know, like <laughs> the. Uh, but I think you're. I think the other thing that would happen is a lot of people would be spending a lot more time with their family around the holidays, as I think what is what would happen. Like I think people would be way less inclined. A lot of people I think would be way less inclined to go out. You know, it's funny. Like the elk thing. Like, like I would still go, because I go to the backcountry and basically camp at this point anyway. If my if my season last year was any indication of what I do when I go elk hunting in the backcountry, <laughs> but uh. Like, cause if I had a, if I had a viable, uh, cow tag last year, like if I could have killed a cow in the unit that I was in, I would have killed a cow last year. Like no, no doubt about it. Like not even a question. Like I was going to shoot the first legal bull that I saw, which in that part of Idaho was basically, it just had to have, I'm pretty sure it just had to have a spike on each side that had to be, I think longer than 12 inches, I think was like the criteria if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And there was one that was coming. He was behind a tree only about seven yards from me. And if he stepped out from in, in uh, behind that cedar tree, like he was going to eat, eat a, eat a stick of carbon. Like that's all there was to it. And I was not going to give one shit what anyone thought about my spike, <laughs> my spike bull. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I just, I want the experience of killing an elk in the mountains. You know what I mean? And I don't really care of, of what variety, but I think you're right, man. I think you would really, if people answer honestly, cause I'll answer honestly, right? Like, there's a part of the season where like a, like a doe is almost off limits for me, depending on the spot that depending on the spot that I'm in. Right. Yep. There are certain spots that I'll go to kill does. You know, there's certain spots that I might hunt early in the season. That is like a really good spot that I know is good. And I'm just like, I've got maybe two, maybe three sits in it all year is all I'm going to get, you know? And so it's like, I really don't want to booger it up until like maybe that last sit. Um, but I definitely, I definitely pass does on chip shots early in the season because one, I either don't want to burn the spot up or two, as shitty as this might sound, I might be like two, there's one spot that's like one particular spot that's like two miles in. It's like, and I had a chip shot at a doe and I was like, there ain't no way I'm dragging a doe out of here. You know what I mean? I was like, there ain't no way. I was like, I'm not doing it. You know? Now, if that was like 125, 130 inch buck, would I shot it? I have no doubt in my mind I would have shot it. Can, you know what I mean? Can you piece them out out there and pack them out? What's that? Can you piece them out out there and pack them out? Yeah. 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 Dude, so I can. So, yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. You so can, I do carry. You don't have to drag them out then. And that's right. No, no. So I did start carrying my Western pack uh, with me uh, this this past year for that. Re well, not to every not to every spot necessarily, but spots where I'm going to be back in kind of far. Like I, I did start carrying my Western pack or at least the fr the frame. Yeah. Um, so I have an easier way to get, um, to get stuff out. So it's, 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 it's interesting. It's different for me for whitetails. It's, there's like a, there's like a, a criteria or a circumstance for out West. Like there isn't one, like, I'm like, whatever, you know, I'll kill whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. Yeah. You know, that's, um, I mean, that's why you go there. Like you put yourself in that position where you're like, I mean, when you're talking about shooting a spike, like when I go elk hunting, I'm like, you put an illegal elk in front of me and I'm at full draw. Like I don't. Yeah. I don't care. Like you go into it and you don't care if you're six miles in or you're 400 yards from the truck. It's like, that's why yeah. you're there. Yeah. <laughs> now I did text you there like around Thanksgiving, we were texting back and forth because I think the last time we talked or maybe it was either the last podcast we did, or maybe it was like the last phone call that we had like during, uh, maybe it was like October or something like that. Um, we were talking about just like, just deer hunting, like just deer hunting. And, like I said earlier, like this season was kind of a kick in the balls for me. So I went out Thanksgiving morning and it was to actually one of my primo spots where it's like, I had a good encounter this year, like the 18th of October. 
and I went into it and I told myself when I walked in, I was like, I'm just deer hunting today. I was like, if, if a doe, if a good doe, I was like, I'm not going to shoot a, a small doe in this, in the area or whatever. I was like, but if a good fat doe comes out and gives me a shot, I was like, I'm killing her. And there were two does kind of messing around me and I couldn't get a shot at one. I was going to shoot one of them. And then finally, like one gave me a shot at like 10 yards and I smoked her, you know, and I text you and I was like picture. And I was like, I went out just deer hunting today. You know what yeah. I mean? And it felt so freaking good. You know what I mean? Like yeah. so good that like I was on cloud nine. It was just like, I, I killed a deer and I, you know, gutted it actually had to kayak it out and stuff and got it back to the house. and was butchering it and it like got to go through the whole thing, you know, like the whole ritual. And it was like, I didn't get anything last year, you know, cause I, I passed some stuff up that I probably should have shot. And, and it was that ritual that I kind of missed. And it didn't matter if it had horns or not. I was like, jazzed you know what i mean yeah. and you know so i don't know man but i mean i would like to say i didn't weigh her though just so you know <laughs> but i mean <laughs> honestly dude that's like that if people hunt for a lot of different reasons right like like you said there, there's times you go out and you're like i'm not shooting a doe like you're mm-hmm. you're a trophy hunter that night like but mm-hmm. the next day you might go into a different spot and you're like man any doe that comes by and so you know i mean people hunt for their own reasons but real like the real takeaway there when you talk about like just going to hunt deer man i think we're kind of missing that message with a lot of people like you don't you don't become a good big buck hunter until you've done a lot of just go hunt deer like typically Mm -hmm. you know like you just don't and when you've done the big buck thing a lot and then you kind of slip back into that mindset where you're like i'm gonna hunt someplace new and if it's if it walks by me it's in trouble it's like it's like you rediscover something like i I do that. I, I shot a little buck this year, muzzleloader hunting in Minnesota. Like I, I had a bad year this year too. I mean, I killed that bull right away and then I killed a decent buck in, in Wisconsin, but like it wasn't a, that fun of a season for me. I had to film a lot and, you know, other than taking my little girls hunting, like I was like, I'm not, I didn't get a lot out of this season the way I wanted to. And so I mm-hmm. went muzzleloader hunting and I hadn't, I hadn't done that in a long time. Had some shit happen, hit a buck that I lost and it, like, I was like, man, I just want to go hunt deer. Like, I just want, I have a buck tag, I have a doe tag, and I just want to go, like, take a good shot and close all the browser windows. And I have a, I have permission on this farm by my house right here in the cities. And he's like, yeah, you can go out there. They, they have like a 28 day gun season here in the metro area. And it, they just piss pound this place. And so I go hmm. out there. And I climb up into my stand and I can look across the highway and see all my deer on the neighbor's property. Like I'm like, <laughs> there's 16 deer, there's box, like everybody's over there cause they can't hunt there. And I have one deer get up out of the cattails and it's like 130 inch eight pointer. And he walks into 75 yards and I text the landowner. I'm like, Hey, cause he, he's like, no big bucks. I can't shoot them. Can't, I can't shoot bucks out there. And so I have to let this buck go and I'm just watching. And it's a beautiful deer, like a beautiful deer. And I'm just like, I hate this so much. Like, I'm not, <laughs> it's not fun. And so I talked to him and I get it. Like, it's his place, whatever. And so I talked right. to him and he's like, in it, we're, we're pretty good buddies, whatever. And he's like, listen, if you want to go and shoot a little one, I don't care. Whatever. Just go, like, we, we're saving that buck. Mm-hmm. So the next night I go out, sit at a little different spot, and all my deer are across the road again. I'm like, they're all, <laughs> there they are. Like, you know, and right you know 10 minutes before dark a little three-pointer walks out and i texted the landowner i'm like are you sure because i'm gonna shoot this sucker and he's like whatever go ahead and as soon as he was like thumbs up it was like an adrenaline rush man and you know like i've killed a lot of deer like this i didn't you know like i wanted this deer i wanted him in the freezer and i wanted to kill one but it was like just that feeling of like now you got to find your shot you got to take it you got to make it and I ended up shooting him pretty far, but it was, it was a good shot and the blood trail sucked. And I just like went through all the emotions of like, holy shit, I got permission to shoot a scrapper and I screwed it up. And I'm like, this doesn't feel good. And it turns out I actually <laughs> did hit him. Really well. He didn't go very far, but the blood trail was not great. And it was just like this weird, like kind of reminder, like, man, there's a lot of enjoyment in this and a lot of like, there's a lot of reward to this that isn't just directly tied to like, I'm going to kill the top end buck in the area and it's all or nothing. Or like, you know, some of the stuff we bring into it. Sometimes when you just back up a little bit and go, I just want to like, I just want to hunt. 
Like, I just want to hunt. And if something, if it unfolds and they come in front of me and I can shoot them and I want to, that's the best thing. And like you said, dragging them out and butchering them and the whole process of looking in your freezer and going, hell yeah, like there's another 40 pounds or whatever. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. It's because, I mean, I think we, the value, like every time we pull out like a packaged burger or a steak or whatever that we're going to eat from that deer, it's like, I can, I see that day again. And I think, I think sometimes we forget that aspect of it and I can just go right back to that spot and I can be having a crap day at work or whatever. And we sit down to eat dinner and we're going to eat the venison that I killed. It's like for like five minutes that we're eating during dinner or 10 minutes that we're eating during dinner, I can like visually go back to that place, you know, and relive it again, you know, and that's, I think an understated kind of value that you get. Cause we all romanticize the mounts we have on our walls. You know, I can go look at downstairs and look at them and be like, Oh, I remember that. or remember that. or remember that. Right. But the same thing happens, at least for me, whenever I'm eating that deer or whatever, and if it's a doe or a buck, doesn't matter. It's like, I go right back to that spot and like how fun the whole experience was, you know what I mean? It's like, cause I mean, let's be honest, like dragging a deer out, regardless of how you do it kind of sucks, but it's like, it's that kind of fun that sucks at the moment. But when you look back on it, you're like, man, that was cool. You know, like that was a good, that was a good day, you know? And I don't know. I'm, I like doing stuff by myself a lot. So like the fact that I was able to do it by myself and just be there didn't have, not that I don't like to talk to my friends, but like was able to just to kind of like be in the moment alone, take my time, you know, and just have a sense of gratitude, you know, like for that whole experience, you know, without, having to, you know, placate to someone else's like excitement or not that that's bad. Cause you'd like to share it with your buddies. Cause I certainly text my buddies. I text you and stuff like that. Right. But it's like being able to take that moment to yourself and just like soak it in, you know, like that to me was, yep. was really important. Um, I don't know, man, maybe it's because we're getting older or, or, or who knows, you know, why those things are, but some of those things just have become more important. I think as I, as I've gone, and uh, I think I'm going to try to do a little more deer hunting this year than I've done in years past. Dude, I think, I mean, I, I think you're right. Like I, I argue with Mark about this all the time. Like I don't, I've never cared less about antlers. Like I'll, I'll never mount another deer. Like I just, I, I like the antlers, but I just don't, it, it's not the same thing to me anymore. Like I, there was a long time in my life where I love putting another deer on the wall, believe me. But now I, I get way more satisfaction out of looking in the freezer. I just do. And mm -hmm. I still I still like the game of chasing big bucks, and I still, like, I like them a lot. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm like you. I've just changed, like, some of my favorite moments from this year, other than, you know, like, my daughters had an awesome seasons. They killed three deer and made good shots, and it was freaking sweet, like, real nice. fun. But just, like, those moments, like you said, where, you know, my favorite was when, when I found my elk this year, you know, my buddy was walking out. Like, I didn't know if I was going to see him again for a couple of days. Like it was, we, we had no way to communicate. He had a bow issue and I'm sitting there in Colorado, six miles deep with a big dead bull and it's getting dark. And you're just like, I mean, it's just a wild experience. Like I can't get that feeling in life very many places. Like, I don't know how to describe it, but you just can't come across that feeling very easily in like a normal everyday type of life and yeah. man it's there's like some mental sustenance to that that you can live off of for a long time and it's not you know it, it's not about just like having that big rack like it's mm -hmm. about that experience of you know like you made the shot you don't know was it good was it bad like what's going to happen am i going to find him tonight or the bear's going to get him like what's going to happen and then you recover that animal and now you're like okay how do i get him out like, I, I don't even, right. I'm not even that confident piecing him out by myself, but I have to, like, I just have right. to dig in and tie up a hook to this tree and just get to work. And it's just like, it's amazing. It's awesome yeah. that we have that. It may be, you know, I'm going to, we're going to kind of bring it full circle here a little bit because, you know, I was just thinking as you were kind of talking about that, like, we don't get that type of experience in many, many places you know, or those places are hard, hard to find. And maybe that's why, like, maybe my perspective of it changed a little bit this year, because like the first time, like there's been three places in my life where I've found that and like truthfully, like found that form of like 
gratitude, elation. You know, one was being in a band, you know, and, and it wasn't so much the crowd and being on a stage that was cool, but it was more, it was more the creative side of things of being in the studio and, and watching like an idea come from like this idea that I had in my head to like a fully orchestrated like song, like with multiple instruments and like the whole idea came to fruition. You know what I mean? Like that was the one place where it was just where you got that kind of like excitement and like almost like connection to something outside yourself. You know what I mean? And then the other spot was like deer hunting. I always said, I was like the closest that I ever got to like the same feeling of being in a band and like having that eureka moment where a song just drops out of the sky into your lap was being in, in a tree with a deer approaching. The only other spot I found it is in jujitsu com competition where you have these butterflies and these jitters. You're about to walk on the mat and it's you against one other person. And one of you is going to get your hand raised at the end. And the only thing between you and getting your hand raised is your, your willingness to do whatever it takes, you know? And it was that kind of, and in, and like having those experiences, maybe it made me kind of appreciate that, man, these moments are so fleeting that if you just don't capture each one of those, you don't know when the next one's going to come by. You know what I mean? And so that's kind of, I think how I started thinking about it was totally. like, I want to drink that in as many times as I can. And I get a sense of like now, like when athletes have to retire, like why it's hard to retire, you know what I mean? Because it's like, they just want to drink. It's not the, for the real ones, it's not necessarily the money or the whatever. It's that like, that it's that environment that they don't want to leave. You know what I mean? Like that, that, that feeling they don't want to let go of, you know what I mean? And like, and then you only get it in certain places. And it's like, when you find a spot where you get it, man, it's like, you just want to keep doing it over and over and over again. Right. And so for hunting, you know, it's, uh, because those are fleeting even more so, and they're less controllable, you know, maybe I just have a deeper appreciation for them now because I'm like, man, like I want, I want that juice as often. Yeah. It's like, I want that juice as often as I can get it. Uh, just, just as a heads up there, I, I lost you for like a minute. Um, I don't, I don't know if it'll matter on my end or not, but you probably want to mark that. Yeah. Marked it. We're good. Yeah. And it won't matter. It'll, it'll, it'll all come through. Did you get it. Or did you hear me there? Yeah, I got you. Okay. You got me I'll, back. I'll pick up right from there then. Yep. Okay. I'll, yep. Uh, I'll, uh, yeah, dude, I... uh, sorry. Go ahead. Do you want me just to pick up right from there? Yeah. Did you hear me? Yeah. You can go ahead and pick up from oh, there. I couldn't, I couldn't tell. I'll, I'll pick up right from there and we can wrap this up, huh? Yep. Yep. Dude, I, I totally agree. Okay. Yeah, man, I totally agree. I'm, I'm in the same spot in life. I'm just chasing those moments. Like whether it's fishing somewhere new, like I'm, I'm kind of loosely planning a trip to Alaska to be a fishing bum for a week just cause I'm like, I know being around brown bears and trying that's going to deliver unto me that kind of feeling you're talking about. And I just, that's another thing like we talked about. I hate to, I kind of hate to be this, you know, dead horse, but like when we lose these opportunities, people, people lose what you're talking about. Like mm -hmm. that, that chance to be in the mountains or that chance to do this or that with whitetails. Like when, when those opportunities go away, it's not just, Oh, now you have easier hunting for yourself. You've taken away like, somebody else or a lot of other people's opportunity to have that amazing experience that you're coveting so hard that you're trying to gatekeep around. And uh, it just drives me crazy. Cause I think, I think there's, I think there's room for everybody, but man, I totally agree. Like there's, there's not that many that things in life that you can do that give you that kind of feeling. And it's, there's every activity that can so worth it. Yeah. Man, I think that's a great place to kind of wrap this thing up, dude. We've been going at it for uh, coming up on close to two hours, dude. So uh, I appreciate you coming on, buddy. Let people out there listening know where they can uh, get all things Tony Peterson. Dude, did we solve all the world's problems? Probably not. Probably caused a few. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, well, it is what it is. But man, it's always fun to chat with you. I love it. 
All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and be sure to subscribe to the podcast in hell. While you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a sub there as well. I'd be super appreciative if you do those couple things for me. Before I shut this thing down, I need to give a big shout out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Spartan Forge, Tethered, Exodus Outdoor Gear, and Genesee Beer. And until next time, we'll see y'all.